Good morning. I don't know if I'm getting picked up here on the mic or not, but we are now uh, on uh, YouTube and on Facebook. We're not on Zoom no, no, this morning. As I'm John getting picked uh, up here on the mic us, on but, Facebook. Um, Look, we're thanks not on to everybody for being out in uh, our third uh, lesson with uh, Dr. Kirkendall, which is we're very grateful uh, for. So if um, you can join me in a word of prayer, please. Gracious God, as we gather here to study the book of Acts, we affirm that Holy Acts. Scripture is the rule of faith and life. We are grateful for this continuing opportunity to learn. We are grateful for this tradition with which your servant Tony Abbott gifted us. We're grateful for the many teachers, and today especially for the Reverend Dr. John Kirkendall, who share their gifts with us. We pray that we may all be doers of your word. We pray that the many years of experience represented by those gathered here may continue to inform us and guide us in the years that remain. We pray and we labor for peace and for justice in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Mm. Now, uh, today, uh, if, if we have questions or comments, what we're going to do is now, Pam uh, is today, going to bring the uh, microphone around. So when it comes to that time, be watching around. for her, and um, maybe that'll make it a little bit easier so to speak up to than uh, having to walk up here and, for her and uh, address it. Um, having to walk uh, here at the here. mic. So, uh, 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 Dr. Kirkendall, thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, Can you all hear me? Dr. Kirkendall, you all want to hear me? Hear me? And Pam is going to be our Vanna White for the day. Everything is good. I can tell you. Everything is good. Um, good. This is the third in the series that we started two weeks ago on uh, the Acts expression of the founding of the Christian community. And it's, um, a, it's a very vivid narrative Christian and one that you community. just... Uh, you get caught up in. I don't know about you all, but if, if you start reading one chapter in the book of Acts, if unless you're supposed to be cooking or doing something like that, you will read three or four before you're done. Read three. Now, I, I passed out, uh, before I begin, though, two words of gratitude. One is to John, obviously, always to John, printing out these things, sending them out to people. He did an act of super irrigation this time by putting together this map. Little small, but we can follow on that and Little see. small, <laughs> we can pretty well follow what's going on there. And second word of thanks I want to say, and I've said it to him before, but I want to say it among all of you, and I hope you join me in among all of you, and I hope you join me. Something wrong? You know, feedback. I bet it is. Okay. Gosh. It's louder than I am. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Another, another, another technocrat steps up. Thank you. <laughs> another uh, second word of thanks Te I want to say, and I know you join me in this. Um, all the time I've been coming to this class since Jesse has been our moderator, we have had the most, most uh, eloquent. I don't think that's it. We've had the most eloquent, thoughtful, pertinent, meaningful prayers at the beginning of class each week. And Jesse, I'm grateful for it, and I know everybody else is too. So thank you. <laughs> Bet you never got a, a, an applause for, for praying before, but that's, that's a good way to start the class. My friend, Ed Palmer. That's a good way to start. That's a good way. Is that me? Yeah. This is not good. You want me to try without the mic? No. Uh, no, but not because. All right. Okay. All right. I'm coming back from the dead on this one. Hey, David. Come in. Well, let me wait just a minute. A minute. What you think? 
Jeg må lytte sammen på. Good. All right. I'll say this, and then I'll repeat it for you. And just I'll say this. this what is it, John? Okay. Uh, if you want me, to just take this off. And turn it. Turn this one off. Yes. What? All right. Is this better? So far, no, no echoes. So we just turn this one off, and I can dive in. Uh oh. Didn't I just hear another echo? No. Okay. Well, good. Well. Back to where we were beginning, as, as I was saying when I was so rudely interrupted by myself. Uh, you have the outline before you, and we are following, as you will recall, uh, the pattern of what I have perceived to be the theme verse in the book of Acts, the eighth verse the of the first chapter, in which, theme verse. in which Jesus says to his disciples just before yes. he leaves them, that uh, he will, they are that, to stay in Jerusalem. They are uh, stay in Jeru Jerusalem. I don't know what to do, y'all. Stay in Jerusalem and uh, stay. In and they are they are to remain there and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit and power. And when the Spirit comes upon them, then they are directed to be. Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth, or and in the, the earth, as the RSV, uttermost in RSV head. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, uh, the ends of the earth. Three kind of categories there, just as in, in summary. And that's what I've been trying to do these three weeks, is to take us through those three aspects of the spread of the Christian community. Uh, and I put in your uh, the first paragraph of the lesson for today some points that I would ask you to remember as we go forward. The first one has to do with what I call the spectrum, but the, what it is is the spread of different kinds of people who encounter the gospel during and after the ministry of Jesus. And those kinds of people include what we refer to as Hebrews and Hellenists, on the left-hand side of the ledger, both of those people, both of those sets of people are Jewish, although the Hebrews tend to speak Aramaic and read the scriptures in Hebrew, and the Hellenists have been exposed to the scriptures of the Jewish community in Greek, in what was called the Septuagint version of the Bible. Next category over is the un unacceptables, and those are people who, for one reason or another, are not looked upon with favor about the Jews who are orthodox and strict in what they, what they believe. Those people would include such people as we saw in er, earlier chapters of Acts, as uh, the Samaritans who were in what uh, one writer refers to as a no-go area in the area of Palestine for Jewish people because these people are half-breeds. They worship not at Jerusalem but at Mount Gerizim. They've given up on the scriptures of the what we call the Old Testament after the first five books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, that's all their Bible. So they're different from the Jews and the Jews disparage them. Also unacceptable we saw was this man who was the, the, the uh, uh, kind of uh, secretary of the treasury for the queen of Ethiopia. And he was a eunuch and thereby, according to Deuteronomy, he was not to be allowed into the assembly of the righteous. So these are people who are on the borderline. They can't get to be Jews, and at the same time, they're not really Gentile Gentiles. So we're right in between there. Then the next two categories, going across the page to the right, the God-fearers are people who are not Jewish, who are Gentiles, but who practice the Jewish faith. Now, sometimes they practice the Jewish faith up to the point of initiation in the faith, the males by circumcision, but other times they just 
obey the Torah, they make alms to the synagogue, they work within the Jewish community, but they're not technically a part of it. That would be Cornelius, of whom we spoke uh, two weeks ago, or, or last week, I guess. And then the, fourth, the fifth category is what I would label pagans, and that, that term is sometimes something which is um, misused, but what it implies in this case is people who have nothing to do with either Judaism or Christianity to this point. Many of them have some religion, many of them have many religions, perhaps a few of them have no religion at all, but these are people who are outside the sphere of influence of Judaism and to this point, Christianity as well. That's the first point to remember. Second point to remember, I would say, is the Stephen event. We talked about Stephen a good bit last week. This man, Stephen, evokes Jewish hostility at the city of Jerusalem, and they accuse him of being against this holy place, i.e. Jerusalem and the temple there, against this holy place and the law. And after the persecution and murder, martyrdom of Stephen, we remember uh, the Jerusalem congregation scatters. Only the apostles stayed back at Jerusalem. Sometimes we wonder why they did, but they stayed at Jerusalem as a kind of a base camp, I suppose, and all the rest of the Jewish community scattered. So they go uh, way, way away from uh, whatever, uh, whatever was, uh, was uh, active at Jerusalem was no longer that way. Now, the third point I make on the point to remember is simply the early missionary efforts. We've already talked about this. Philip goes to the Samaritans. Peter, go, Peter and John have to go there for some reason to verify that this is what Philip had actually done. Then Philip encounters this Ethiopian eunuch and he is converted and baptized. Then Peter and Cornelius have this interaction over on the coast of, of Palestine. Eventually Cornelius and his whole household become a part of the Christian community. And then Peter has to go back and explain what he's done. The fourth thing I want to remember, I want to ask you to remember is the, the influence of Jerusalem I'll say a little bit more about this than these other points because when you look at what Jerusalem means in the early chapters of the book of Acts, it's almost inconceivable by the time that you get to chapter 28 of Acts, it's no big thing about Jerusalem anymore. The picture has shifted, the focus has shifted, the ballast of the Christian community has shifted. You remember in the early days following Pentecost, Pentecost in the days following, thereafter, it was we were told that in addition to the 120 people who were waiting in the upper, upper room for the descent of the Holy Spirit, they added 33,000 on Pentecost, 3,000 on Pentecost, and 5,000 just a few days later. So all of a sudden you get this exponential growth, this explosive growth within the community. And they have to undertake a lot of different things in order to, to manage that growth at Jerusalem. And then, thinking back to what we just said about Stephen, as soon as they've done that, almost as soon as they've got that in order feeding the widows and doing all the rest of the things to have a kind of closely knit community, they get scattered throughout Palestine because of the, the persecution following the martyrdom of Stephen. So you got a lot of people, initial growth spur, and then they scatter. And the second thing here is uh, about Jerusalem, those who stay there, those who are there, have a responsibility to the rest of the community to maintain the practice, praxis of Judaism. That is to say, to go to the temple, to do the rituals of the temple, to make sacrifices at the temple, they were kind of the rear guard who were dealing with the, the original sorts of things which were so significant to the Jewish people. Now, the issues that these people who stayed in Jerusalem confronted were threefold. The first issue they really confronted was the fact that they said Jesus was the Messiah. And so many other people in Jerusalem, devout Jews, had nothing to say about that. They didn't believe the Messiah had come. This is a Messiah, Messianic sect which emerges from Judaism at the same time that all these other sects we talked about, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes, the others, they're all factoring out of the central focus of Judaism. And here's just another among the group. But these people in this particular group, in addition to having to defend the fact that they believe Jesus to be the Messiah, they have to focus on two other aspects of Judaism. One aspect of Judaism, which they have to look at very, very carefully, 
is the matter of monotheism. Just think about that for a minute. I haven't thought about it until I was studying up a bit. But they get to Jerusalem. They say, we found the Messiah. This Jesus is the Son of God. Jews would probably be saying at this point, just a minute. Go back to the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy and think. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And now you're coming in here and telling me we've got two of them. And later on, you're going to tell me we need three of them because we've got the Holy Spirit as well. And this is an issue which really, in my mind's eye at least, over the scope of church history, that's an issue which really next, never gets settled, settled until about the fourth century. They begin to try to settle it, settle it at the Council of Nicaea in uh, 323 AD. And of course, that's, that's the original origin of what has morphed into what we call the Nicene Creed. But they were wrestling with this idea, if God is God, and God is one, how can Jesus be God at the same time? And that was a kind of uh, an Achilles heel for them in dealing with their brother Jews at Jerusalem all the time. And then the third thing they face, in addition to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, we have a monotheistic tradition here. The third thing they face for sure is, what are you going to do with the Torah? Now, some things about the Torah are going to be just fine. You get along just all right with all these things that are required or not required in the Torah. But there are going to be other things which are obviously going to be bones of contention, as we'll see later on today. So the, the rap on the Jews at Jerusalem and Christ, uh, Jewish Christians at Jerusalem and, and Christians as they scattered throughout the, the whole of, of, of the Roman Empire is that uh, they don't keep the Torah. They do what they want and they set aside what they want. The whole thing comes to a head, as, as you all know if you read the lesson, the whole thing comes to a head in the issue of circumcision. What do you do if a person converts to a male, converts to be a Christian? Do you make him be circumcised before you really be a Christian and fulfill the Jewish law? Or is there another way to work this thing out? So those people in Jerusalem were really kind of holding the fort and dealing with these big issues that come along. The Jerusalem church was responsible for what we might call quality control. Remember, Peter had to come back to report to him. I, I ask you to uh, read the first 18 verses of, uh, of the 11th chapter. When, when Peter comes back to report to him, and what he does essentially is summarize what happened in his encounter with Cornelius. But the burden of the whole thing is, explain yourself to us. Why have you done the things you've done? Can we accept this effort that you've undertaken? Is that me talking? Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, so they kind of have quality control. They have to judge the role and the scope and the efficacy of this whole missionary effort. You will notice, we noticed this week, they validate the ministry of Paul all along the way. And uh, so they are really kind of uh, command central for saying what's right and what's wrong, at least here in these early chapters. Now here's one thing I want you to notice as we go along. It may not have to do directly with Jerusalem as Jerusalem as the kind of lodestone of the Christian movement. But watch as you go along through the book of Acts and watch how invariably the forces who are against Christianity in Jerusalem are typically Jewish and not Roman. And watch the further you go all throughout the book of Acts, the fact that when Jesus gets, I mean, when Paul gets in trouble in these various places, most of the time it's the Jews who are coming after him and most of the time it's the Romans, the Roman officials, who ultimately bail him out. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing this kind of shift of values. If, if you read the Gospels, you know, it is Pilate who crucified Christ. If you read the book of Acts, the best you can get is that the Jews condemned him and handed him over to Pilate to be crucified. And it goes from there. Now, if you if you're... Uh, hyper-political, I guess you would have to say uh, that they're playing to the crowd at this point because at the time that Luke is writing the, the, the book of Acts, there is no Jerusalem to appeal to and the Roman Empire is the dominant vehicle through which uh, Christianity will be spread to the end of the earth. So there's this kind of dichotomy here. Jerusalem wanes and Rome kind of 
comes into center stage, not so much as a, a religious center for the Christian movement, but as a political center which does not, at least at this point, disdain the Christian movement. It's an interesting thing to watch. The blame is shifting from Rome uh, to Jerusalem. Now, a last thing I, I mentioned here in terms of these background things was the conversion of Paul. I put conversion in parentheses because many biblical scholars say that's not what it was at all. It was not really a conversion. It was perhaps a commission of Paul to do a particular job. It was a continuation of the mission of the Christian community and it was worked toward the completion of that charge to go to the ends of the earth. And Paul is working, we need to bear in our minds, Paul is working as a Jew. He never is not a Jew. He may be a Christian Jew, but he is always a Jew. So this Jew comes into these communities with this kind of messianic optimism that typifies Jesus' followers, and he finds himself early on to be designated almost certainly to be the one who is to pursue this mission to the Gentiles. So here we have Paul in a circumstance in which he is going to be kind of the transition figure from, from Christianity for the Jews to Christianity for the whole world. Now, uh, maybe I'll stop there in just a minute and see if y'all got any, any things that you think I've left out that are important in these last two weeks. Faye. John, did you say last week that Jerusalem was destroyed in like 80 something? 70. And what is the book written? About which side of that? Is it? The earliest, earliest is possibly in the mid 80s, and it may be as late as 100. So not only are you uh, at least 40 years removed from the crucifixion, you're another 15 to 20 years removed from the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was destroyed twice. We'll come back to this a little bit later. But uh, Vespasian wanted to put down a rebellion in Palestine and he sent his son Titus over there, and Titus just whipped it all into shape in several weeks. Destroyed the temple at Jerusalem, uh, pretty much destroyed the city, and really kind of knocked out the idea that the focal point of Judaism has got to be that sacred temple. Wasn't there anymore. Then uh, 50 some years later, Hadrian comes in, and he raises it to the ground, R-A-Z-E, raises it to the ground, and didn't, doesn't spread salt on it like they did down in Carthage, but he almost makes it uninhabitable. So that by uh, that time, there's no place there for any kind of a focus of any movement to be any longer. And we'll see later, uh, obviously, the, the next uh, logical uh, candidate for being kind of a home base for everything is going to be Antioch in Syria. And that uh, Antioch, I'm going to talk about it later, but Antioch kind of comes up as, as kind of the, the birthplace of Christianity or the cradle of Christianity, maybe not the birthplace. Uh, Monique, I saw you were in. Um, in addition to the division between the Christians and the Jews, there was also the first Christian martyr. Stephen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Stephen is, is used here as uh, exemplum gratior, the best example you can get, the first example you can get of somebody who actually gets killed after Jesus, at least, for the faith. James, the brother of, of John, son of Zebedee, is going to get killed later on. You're going to get these little flashes of people who are driven from their homes, who are killed, who are persecuted, and that's going to be... A, a now sub-theme of the book for the rest of the book. But Stephen is really uh, the exemplar, and you look at the Stephen story we did last week, and, and Stephen's story in some ways approximates the story of Jesus. And when you get down to the end, and Stephen says, in essence, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Heard those words before. And then right at the end he says, into thy hand I commend my spirit, 
There are those words before too. So it's a kind of it's kind of an echo of Jesus in behalf of Jesus. You know, we talked the first week about this word martyr comes from the Greek martis, which just means be a witness. So all these guys are witnesses, but you can put a capital M on martyr if you want to talk about somebody like Stephen. And others will suffer the same, but Stephen is kind of the example that Luke wants to use. And by the way, you all know I'm using Luke as a, as a catch-all for whoever it was that wrote this, but let's say Luke. Uh, Bill. Besides Alexandria, what other centers of Judaism existed uh, before Jesus? Um, well, uh, Antioch was one. Tarsus was one. The diaspora carried Jews uh, pretty much everywhere, even over into Achaia. And you're going to find, as Paul goes through this, these missionary journeys, we'll talk about this also in a minute, as Paul goes through his missionary journeys, almost inevitably, in every community, he looks for the synagogue first. Now, that doesn't mean there's got to be a big population of Jews, but sometimes there is. But there's got to be at least a million. There's got to be at least 10 males, and they can't have one. The interesting thing, when he goes to Philippi, you know, that's where Lydia is, and they don't have enough men to have a million. So they just, the women and whatever men there are go down by the river on the Sabbath, and do their thing, but it's not a synagogue. But almost every place, without exception, he goes to the synagogue, and as we'll see later on, almost every place where he goes to the synagogue, they run him off, but that's another story. We'll come back to that. But Alexandria had a great many. Uh, Antioch did. Uh, every one of these cities I'm gonna talk about later had a pretty indigenous Greek, uh, a Jewish community, which didn't date to recent days. A couple of them. Uh, had Jewish communities who were settled there because, believe it or not, these were Jews who had been in the, in the Roman uh, military, maybe as adjunct from a, a unit down in Palestine, but they had been Roman soldiers, and they were resettled there. Resettled there because they gave you free land, but also resettled there because if there was an uprising, who do you turn to? You get these boys that know what they're doing to put down the uprising. So they're Jews pretty much everywhere. Other questions? Well, I, I want to take this, the, the main purpose of the day really is, is what Paul does. And I want to take you kind of through this. And want, we, we've got to have a little bit of background before we can get into the actual uh, missionary efforts that he made. Uh, first thing I want to say is something that I don't want to say in order to disillusion you, but I want the fact of the matter is when we look at the narrative of the life of Paul, and probably these others too, but especially Paul, we cannot always exactly reconcile what Paul says about his life in Galatians, in the two Corinthian letters we have, which may be four, but anyway, two Corinthian letters we have. Uh, in other places, Paul intimates things about his life that don't fit in with the story that Luke tells us in Acts. You can't get the chronology quite right. And oftentimes when Paul is doing this, obviously, he's doing it kind of in self-defense, trying to explain to people that he really is the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he gets a little uh, testy about it at while. They look at me, I've been crucified, I mean, I've been, I've been whipped five times, I've been shipwrecked, I've been put in jail and all these things, trying to validate his ministry by saying what his experiences have been. And although you get some similar details, in what Luke is saying, you have to recognize when all said and done, Luke is not writing a biography. What Luke is doing is talking about how the gospel gets spread from Jerusalem to the end of the church. And he uses it in the last two thirds of the Acts of the Apostles. He uses Paul as his vehicle for making that story told. So you get these autobiographical glimpses in Paul's letters, but you also have Luke writing what we might call a theological history. We've already talked about the fact that history in the ancient world and history in this world. If I write a book of the history of Presbyterianism, I've got to work with documents. I've got to work with known facts. I've got to work with what personalities said about themselves. I've got to go to a lot of different sources and pick from those sources the things that I'm best, that I think best convey what the history of Presbyterian Church is all about. 
If Luke wants to tell you that the Christian gospel is going to the whole world, all bets are off. He's going to tell about things that happen, but he's going to tell them in his own way. And he's going to shape them so that we have a coherent narrative that we can believe how this thing got going. So uh, the words that we have about Paul's life, for example, are dominated by the purpose of the book. And the purpose of the book, you will recall, is to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, a word or two about Paul's strategies. Usually when Paul comes into a community, he seeks out the Jewish community first. And if there's a synagogue there, he's very much inclined to go to the synagogue. Usually when he speaks to these Jewish people, he uses pretty much the same kerygma. Remember, that's the basic message line we heard in Peter's sermon. Pretty much the same kerygma that, that Peter did. Setting up the history of Judaism as a backlog for this, bringing it on down to the present day when this long expected Messiah has arrived and been born. He is then taken and crucified. He rises from the dead and people who hear all this story and believe are invited to receive the Holy Spirit and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. So it's the same basic message as you would have read in Peter's sermons. Although sometimes he tailors the message in order to try to meet the particular community. And we'll come back to this when we talk about uh, Paul's visit to Acts. But the, the essential thing about this is he is trying to move out of the Old Testament narrative within the synagogue to convince people that the Messiah has come. Now, often uh, what happens, first of all, is there's a revival. Everybody gets real excited. Let's go hear this guy talk. But the revival is also frequently uh, followed by a reaction or even in some cases a, a riot. And riot, the riots in most cases, not all, but most of them, are fomented by the Jews. This is a pushback. This guy is stepping into our territory and we've got to stop him. And so there's that kind of reaction. That means that in this missionary effort, Paul is often in trouble with the officials in the community in which he is found. However, as I said to you just a few minutes ago, he is also exonerated in one way or another by these officials. Sometimes he plays the I am a Roman citizen card and that gets him off a lot of trouble. But most of the time, these people are harder on the Jews than they are on Paul by far. And he usually, in all these places where he goes, he usually makes substantial headway with the Gentiles. A couple of exceptions, but many times he is dealing with people who either have no relationship with the Christian faith whatsoever or have been sort of curiosity seekers who are hedging their bets and doing a both and with religions in these communities where they live. Oh, I am, I am a person who goes to the synagogue, but I also worship the goddess Artemis or Diana in Ephesus, for example. And Paul's not going to take that. Paul says, you fish and cut bait. You go to the Christian message or you go to these other places, but you don't do both. Now, last thing I want to do in kind of setting things up for the tale of five cities, as I've said, is to give you just a quick overview of the three journeys. If you'll take out your maps, and sometimes these colors kind of blur, I mean, run together. But what we have here, I, I divide, there are three journeys, but there are four things that happen really. Because um, the first thing that happens is Paul and uh, Barnabas are commissioned and to go into Asia Minor, which is that part just up on the right hand uh, above the Mediterranean Sea. And um, so they go up there, uh, they go to Cyprus first and they have a really kind of fun encounter with a the fellow there that tries to get on the, the case and he's blinded for his efforts. I don't know if that's a good, good thing to say about Paul, but the man gets blinded. And then they go on up into Asia Minor and they work their way up to this city of Antioch, which is where we're gonna have a little stopover when we come back because uh, he preached a very long and uh, elaborate sermon there. And then uh, 
they revisit the various places that they've been to before, Iconium, Derby, Lystra, in that little region, and then they head back to Jerusalem. They come back to Jerusalem and they are encountered there by what is, was referred to, scholars don't use this term anymore, but it was referred to as the Jerusalem Council. Uh, it's not a council like name tags and speakers and all that by any means, but it's a place where the leaders of the church of Jerusalem are brought together to evaluate Paul is doing and to see if something can be done to give him encouragement or whether they need to clip his wings, pull in his horns a little bit and make him be a little less aggressive than he, than he, he has been. And, and the issue which is here is the issue of circumcision and the issue of those people who are converted from from paganism to Christianity, how they fit with the pe people who converted from Judaism to Christianity. So these are the two things that come before the council. The main players in this conversation are gonna be James, the brother of Jesus, who is the leader of the community, the uh, Jerusalem community. Uh, Peter is there, Barnabas is there, Paul is there. And it's a kind of a debate as to what is appropriate with regard to requirements to be placed on people who join the faith from outside the Jewish tradition. Uh, and the real, the real nub of the issue is circumcision. And that's where all the, the furor has been raised in these uh, Jewish communities uh, where Paul has visited, that you don't want them to be circumcised, how can they be Jewish if they're not circumcised? So they bring this issue back, the, and the debate uh, is undertaken here, the 15th chapter, which I, which I asked you to read, uh, 15th chapter is kind of the burden of the debate. And uh, various people speak. Peter uh, speaks up for openness, which uh, is kind of at variance with what Paul says about what Peter uh, said. Uh, in, in Paul says in Galatians that he, he confronted Peter to his face on this because Peter wasn't playing true. But at any event, when they get to Jerusalem, they're pretty much talking on the same side of the issue. Uh, Peter said, uh, I, I, Peter says he thought he was to be the one through whom the Gentiles would receive the message of good news. And he told, reminded them again about what he said in, uh, in dealing with Cornelius. And then um, he also makes a real interesting little point. He says, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will by following the law. The whole assembly kept silence on and on. James speaks up. James says, uh, I've reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled or from blood. Interesting little uh, codicils there. You can do what you want, but no, no uh, food offered to idols, no, things for, uh, no fornication, no things strangled or in blood. Many scholars say that what's going on there is an, an encouragement to them in the close quarters of a Christian community not to do things which would be offensive to people who are uh, Jews become Christians, such as food offered to idols, uh, the, the fornication that would take place with the prostitutes at, at these various sanctuaries of these other gods, uh, food that's been strangled or in blood, which is a part of the ancient uh, Hebrew approach to dietary restrictions. And so, so say, you don't have to do everything, but please do these. This is kind of throwing the bone to the Jewish Christians. But it's also, you think about the idea of having church picnic and some of these Gentile Christians come in and say, oh look, I made ham sandwiches. <laughs> Won't go anywhere. So they're trying to say, let's ease the way. But in essence, what they do eventually is to, uh, again, again, James, once again, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on, no for, on you no further bur burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. In other words, okay, we signed off on this. You can go ahead. So this visit to Jerusalem is very important because it gives Paul his marching orders 
in the way that he hadn't had them before. So, uh, that having taken place, the next uh, thing in this overview of the three journeys is the, the, the effort that goes uh, into the Aegean area. And for this, Paul and Barnabas split up. Barnabas takes Mark. Uh, Paul didn't want to take Mark, maybe because Mark left them halfway through the first journey. But Paul takes Silas and Luke and others, and they go uh, in the direction across Asia, which is modern-day Turkey, and they go in the direction of Greece. Not anything much said about how you get there or why you're going there until uh, they wander around, and Paul says a couple of times he is prevented by the Spirit from speaking the word in these places in Asia, Asia Minor, and then uh, there comes a time uh, when they came to this uh, town in Troas, during the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man from Macedonia pleading with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we went and meet. We immediately used, tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Something I want to call to you, uh, attention about that last sentence, and that is, oh, Paul is doing this, they are doing this, and finally you get to verse 10, and it says, when we'd seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over. So the we, the plural, has some people convinced that this is a part of a kind of a diary or a record. And throughout the, the remaining half of the book of Acts, you have several extensive passages we call the we passages. One of them in particular that I find fascinating is the we passage about the ship, shipwreck that Paul gets into on his way to Rome. And so these things crop up and you either, either you've got the author making a, some kind of literary convention here or you've got an eyewitness account of what's going on, which is a very interesting thing to think about. So anyway, he's called to Macedonia and Macedonia, which is uh, partly uh, still Macedonia and partly uh, modern Greece, Macedonia is in that area of Greece over there that you see on the map, yellow and green, in the middle of the map almost, a little left of center. And what happens there is this series of remarkable visits of Paul to these communities, which are strung out uh, uh, north to south along the, the Grecian Peninsula. He stops at Philippi, a wonderful story there about Lydia, the merchant, the person who is the dyer of purple, and she takes them under wing, and Paul and Silas get in trouble because Paul um, exercises a demon for this young woman that is being used for profit. And so they have to leave, and then they go to Thessalonica, the Jews get them on there, they have to leave again. They go to Berea, the Jews from Thessalonica come to Berea and said, don't listen to this man, they leave again. Um, Silas and, and, uh, and the others, or apart from him then, Paul winds up alone in Athens. Come back to that in a minute. And then uh, he finally turns up in Corinth and stays there for about a year and a half. That's where he meets Priscilla and Aquila and becomes a tent maker. Ergo, people who do tent making ministry still today. And then finally, go back to, to uh, uh, Antioch, uh, touch base there, and then comes to Ephesus and stays there for over two years. So that's the overview of these journeys. You have them here on your map. Now what I want to do with the rest of my time with you is to talk about some of these cities and what's distinctive about what happens in these places. But before I do, do any of y'all have questions you want to raise? Lacey? Uh, that is you, Lacey, behind that mic. Okay. Uh, the council in Jerusalem um, how, how do they come together and, and who are they? Well, they're obviously people who are in the leadership positions. Uh, uh, you know, any of the disciples that are within shouting distance, the original 12 would be expected to be there. And, uh, you know, the word council ought to be taken with a grain of salt. It may be just the folks who are there and who are interested. It may be kind of like a town meeting. But it's, it's, it's critical because the leadership there coalesces behind this, this, um, this mission to the Gentiles and 
it, it's almost clear that uh, that when they do this, though they don't have to write up a big document about it, they send a letter with these people back to those other people saying, you're doing all right, but these are the things we wish you would avoid. Paul, for his part, a couple of times, indicates that that was not valid, that they didn't follow that, that they just went and took them as they were. If the Holy Spirit came to them and they were baptized, then they're in. And what they do afterward, you can have these kind of nitpicking arguments about it. In 1 Corinthians, you know, there's all that stuff about food offered to idols and comes back and forth and says, no, it doesn't offend you, but if it offends somebody else, you don't want your brother to suffer, all that sort of stuff. But really, these are minor points. And what's clear about it is that that opening of a door is now complete. And I think uh, to call it a council or a conference uh, dignifies it far beyond what it would be in terms of an organizational activity, but it, it's a gathering. Pain. I have a question that makes this question possible. I was surprised at the Sadducee's um, anger with Paul because he believed in the resurrection and they didn't believe in the resurrection. Yeah. So my question is, was the um, negative response from the Jews due more to the Pharisees or the Sadducees? Uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, uh, Sadducees opposed Paul because he did not believe in the resurrection. And the question is, uh, were the Pharisees or the Sadducees more responsible for the rift between Judaism and Christianity? Is that right? I don't know. Uh, you know, they both had a, they both had an iron in the fire, certainly. I think some of the Pharisees were already starting off in a different direction which didn't bother them about the resurrection or anything else because we're watching here. One of the writers I studied said that you saw twins born at the same time. And these twins kind of grew up together, not always getting along with each other like twins don't. But then finally going off in different directions. One direction is the mission of the, of, the, of the church to the Gentiles to the whole world. The other direction is an internal direction in which Pharisees, and I'm sure some others, kind of close in upon themselves and begin what we refer to as rabbinical Judaism, which is the, 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 law, the far end of what we see in Judaism today. Lots of changes in between, but it's essentially taking a specific passage of scripture and hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, and not getting outside of it for its ramifications. So in that sense, I suppose for any kind of staying power, it would be uh, it would be the Pharisees who were more responsible for the ongoing presence of Judaism as an alternative to Christianity. What else? Marie? I believe that's what some people think. And and you know it you could, a big part. Are the we passages intended to apply, imply that Luke was with Paul and writing these down himself just from memory as a part of this larger narrative? And the answer is that's what some people presume. And other people presume it might have been somebody else who kept a diary and Luke got access to it. And other people presume it might have been a literary convention and Luke just made it up out of whole cloth so we'd get interested again. But, but the, I, nobody knows. Uh, okay, I want to talk to you just a little bit. I want to leave some more time at the end for questions. I want to talk to you. I started this out to be a tale of two cities and three more, and I thought that was just too cute to give to you on Sunday morning. So this, this is a tale of five cities. I picked five of these cities for very specific reasons. I've been reading a book. Or I read it before, but I read it again for this. Uh, by Rodney Stark, which is entitled Cities of the Empire. Rodney Stark is a sociologist, and most of his work that I was aware of has been uh, American sociology and religion in America, contemporary stuff. But he goes back and he does a very interesting uh, sociological historical study of the cities in the Roman Empire. And he does it because he makes this statement right to first, and I thought this was fascinating. He said, he says, all ambitious missionary movements are or soon become urban. 
And thereafter, he goes into a description of the cities of the Roman Empire. He discovers that by the year 100, which would be just after the Acts of the Apostles had been written, probably 10 years of ballpark, after the book is written, he discovers that across the Roman Empire, going all the way from over in the Mesopotamian area, all the way, and you can trace it across the map, all the way, it's not all the way here, but all the way to Spain and to Londonium, now London, you had cities uh, that were uh, important in the empire. Now his criteria is a place that seems to have had more than 30,000 people there. And he fit, finds, as I said, 31 of them scattered all over the empire. He tells it like it is about these cities. He says they're small, they're dirty, they're impoverished, they're plague-ridden, they're disaster-prone, fires, floods, all earthquakes, all that, but densely populated. And though he doesn't say this, I would say that the answer to why this is the focal point for missionary effort is it's just like Willie Sutton in the banks. That's where the money is. Well, Paul, that's where the people are. So he's going to these cities, and he's going to hit the big ones. He hits the little ones, too, as you'll see, but he hits the big ones. And when he comes there, what he finds almost always is a gathering of di diasporic Jews who come there either early or late, some of them have come there like those soldiers in the Roman legions who have settled there and that's a good place to live. Others have moved out to try to make a living. Some of them have fled persecution. So all kinds of reasons for being there, but many times they've been there for, you know, half a dozen generations or so. So they're well settled there, or some of them are at least. And when you look at the religious ecosystem of most of these cities, what you really see is what might be compared to a Petri dish. A lot of different things kind of seething under the surface there all at once. All these religions, many of which were not mutually exclusive. You could be, uh, you could be a devotee of, of uh, Mithra and of Diana and of the, some of the Roman deities. All those things at once. Nobody cared. An interesting point about that is the broader the polytheism, the weaker the allegiance to any particular religion religion in most places because hadn't got that much spirit to spread around. So the question arises, how hard would it be to crack this ecosystem with a movement if that movement were exclusive? If you're not told, okay, you can worship Diana on Thursday night, but you've got to be in church on Sunday. You can't do that anymore with this kind of mission that we're looking at because this is the way. And so as you see this happening, uh, it's, it's obvious that Paul and others are going to cause a stir when they come in and say, you're not right, you've got to go along with what we have. So, using 30,000 30, uh, people as criteria, there are 31 uh, of these uh, cities across the Roman Empire in the first, at the end of the first century uh, common era. But, here's the thing to remember, one of those cities is not Jerusalem for reasons aforestated, stated. Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus in 70. Jerusalem was gonna be destroyed in another 30 years or so uh, by Hadrian. It was gonna be nothing. It was not gonna be a player in the activities of urban life in the Roman Empire at all. Now, what I wanna do next is, I wanna take us through five of these cities and show you a little bit different of a, a kind of a profile in each of these cities, which works to the way, uh, speaks to the way in which the, the followers of Jesus will establish themselves in that community and what they will subsequently do in the name of, of the effort. Uh, the first ones I list is Antioch in Syria. Uh, uh, one of the Persian emperors, uh, one of the generals who was given uh, Alexander the Great's empire after Alexander died was Seleucus and he founded Antioch in Syria, which is now just barely across the border in Turkey, if you go looking for it today. He found it in 300 BC. It was the third largest city in the whole Roman Empire at the end of the first century. It had about 100,000 people. It was the capital of the Roman province of Syria. It was wealthy, cosmopolitan, a very diverse place. There were Jews living there who'd been there for a long time. This is one of those instances in which many of them were retired military. But uh, Antioch is situated, look over there where it is, right over in that very corner, 
uh, the upper right hand corner of the Mediterranean Sea there. And it's the third largest. It's the, it's the government of, of the province of Syria. Uh, uh, it turns out it's on one of the main roads east and west. It is at the mouth of the Orantes River, which comes down out of Asia. So it's, it's right in the focal point where it can be successful. It's also a place in which Paul has a safe haven. Time and again, Paul comes to Syria, comes back to Syria because the people there endorse and encourage what he's trying to do. So Paul comes there, and of course, as you will recall, this is the place, the first place, uh, that uh, the followers of Jesus were called Christians. And there was a mix here of Jews and Gentiles there who were very supportive to Paul. So second only to Jerusalem in the life of this earliest church, Antioch is the kind of base to be touched if you're moving through uh, the mission of Christianity. Now, I, I thought it was really interesting to take the next Antioch, which is Antioch in Syria, in, in Pisidia, and the name is the same because the Seleucids had a series of, of monarchs who were all named Antiochus. Uh, the most famous, or this, uh, this famous of them all, was Antiochus Epiphanes, who went and put uh, Greek statues and, and sacrificed pig meat at the temple in Jerusalem, and he was called the Abomination of the Desolation. And of course, that gave rise two centuries before Christ to the emergence of, of, of the Maccabean movement. But anyway, had all these people named Antiochus, and so these two cities take the same name. Antioch in, in uh, Pisidia is uh, in modern day Turkey, kind of in the booties. It really doesn't qualify, qualify as one of these cities of empire because it was a little bit less than 30,000. But it was started as a border fort and Rome later used it as a free city and settled veteran soldiers there once again as a kind of a, as a kind of a bulwark between two provinces. It was at the convergence of two major roads, so it was a commercial center. Uh, it was sometimes spoken of as the miniature Rome on the mainland of Asia, which meant that it was a, a place of, of great substance, not much left to notify where it was today, but it was, it was a special place. Diverse population with Jews. Uh, I showed you, asked you to have, take a look at the 13th chapter in the place where Paul preaches to them because this is pretty typical of the way Paul is going to express his message. And though we'll not read all of it, I think I'll remind you of the basic things of what he's trying to do. First of all, he goes through that narrative that Peter has gone through in his sermons as well of the history of Israel. Uh, some, the, some scholars refer to that in German as the Heilsgeschichte, the holy history of Israel. And these boys, Peter and Paul, pick up on this and give you uh, the kind of the Cliff's Note version of it, but they give it with a certain emphasis on the things they want to be remembered. Time and again, they come back to topics. Often they come back to David and his crucial role in this whole thing. But the, Paul's sermon, which is there in the 15th chapter, goes through that, um, that whole recitation of uh, the history of Israel and all the way down to John's baptism, and then he addresses the people in the synagogue, my brothers, you descendants of Abraham's family, and then others who fear God. The message of salvation has been sent to us. And then he goes on to say, uh, in talking to the group, and I'll go down to the, let me see, 38th verse, uh, let it be known to you therefore, my brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you by this Jesus everyone who believes is set free from all those sins from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Now there's a hooker there in this sermon for these Jewish people already. Been trying to follow this law of Moses all these years and all of a sudden what I've got to say to you is here's the other way to do this and this is the way that God prescribes for you. So that, that's what you get there and then I think the most important verse in this whole sermon is down there at verse 46. Uh, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you, i.e. the Jews, 
Since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, we're now turning to the Gentiles. And so there you get the pivot point of this whole thing. Now, three more, and I got to go a little faster on these. I apologize. Didn't plan the time too well. But, um, uh, the next one I'll cover very briefly is Athens. Athens, large enough, 75,000, kind of the cradle of democracies we always know, but a city that had fallen in uh, to some uh, disdain by this time. It had been often conquered, often ignored, overtly polytheistic, polytheistic to the extreme. It still had an, an intellectual uh, capacity, uh, a reputation that was the rival to Alexandria down in Egypt, and also, by the way, to Tarsus, where Paul had grown up. Those three were kind of the academic centers of of the, of the empire at that time. But Paul in, in Athens made one of these efforts to uh, convert his method of bringing the message of the gospel to the audience to whom he was preaching. And the best can be said is uh, every preacher has a bad day and this effort really didn't go very far. Uh, he was looked upon in Athens with condescension and so ultimately, he just departed and moved on down to Corinth. Now, Corinth is, uh, is a very interesting city because Paul spent a year and a half there, visited there again, wrote several letters. We know of four letters he wrote, maybe even more. Uh, and Corinth was this really interesting city because it was on the isthmus between the Peloponnesian Peninsula and the rest of Greece. So it was a choke. It was the, the little neck in the hourglass of Greece. And anything that came one side to the other had to pass through Corinth. It had been destroyed by the Romans, rebuilt. They made it the capital of Achaia. But it was a city that had a bad reputation. Indeed, I think it could have made Las Vegas look like Montreal. Uh, to Corinthianize in the ancient world was uh, just a symbol of saying, you're going to go raise all the hell you can raise as fast as you can raise it. But, it also was a city in which religion was taken seriously. Uh, Jews had settled there. Uh, in, in part, it was taken seriously because it was a seaport city on both sides. Boats came in. There was a traverse of about two and a half miles across the isthmus, and then they went out the other port and back and forth. So uh, it was a city that was uh, uh, well populated with people from all over the world. Paul there met. Uh, these two, Priscilla and Aquila, and joined them in their business, tent making, stayed there a year and a half, uh, and in his encounter with, uh, with the Roman officials, legalized Christianity, or got uh, permission for legalized, for Christianity to have the same status in Judaism within that community. Uh, the final one I want to mention was Ephesus. I mentioned it in part because it's the place where Paul stayed the longest, over two years. And he uh, was working in a city that was, there had been a city there or a, a settlement there for over 9,000 years. Uh, Ephesus, the capital of the province of Asia. And the main thing about Ephesus in terms of tourists that day and to some degree still this day is the temple of Artemis of Diana, who was the goddess of fertility, the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of childbirth, got us a lot of things, but they had uh, this incredible statue there, probably the biggest building in the whole of the Roman Empire, one of the 700 wonders of the world, not much left of it now, but you can see where it was. But uh, in any event, he stayed there for two years, two and a half years, went through the usual modus of going to the synagogue, some acceptance, some rejection, and then some opposition, then he had several clashes of paganism there, the most serious one of which was really not of his doing. It had more to do with economics than of the gospel directly. And that was the silversmiths there who made idols of the goddess Artemis. And if you've ever seen that idol, it's a little unusual. It has somewhere a ballpark about 40 breasts on it. But in any event, uh, 
the people who, who made the idols said that this guy was cutting into their business and so demanded that this man be thrown out of town. Uh, he leaves, but once again, Rome saves his bacon, but he leaves and he heads back for Jerusalem. The rest of the story, uh, the epilogue, he goes to Jerusalem, he's accused by Jews, he falls into the hands of the legal system. Every time he's tried, he tries to play the, the Roman citizen card again, and it looks like it gets, gets him into more trouble than it helps him, but eventually you will see this pilgrimage which leads through a very perilous journey by sea and eventually comes to, to the city of Rome itself. And those verses that I ask you to read are kind of the conclusion to the whole thing. Now, I, I want to go beyond that for just a second before we quit. And I want to talk about the fact that the destruction of Jerusalem really turns, turns this whole thing upside down. I mentioned earlier the emergence of rabbinical Judaism is a means in which traditional Judaism can distinguish itself over against Christianity and move as far as it can move. Also, uh, the, the dependence upon Jerusalem that the early church had has been completely replaced by dependence upon something else, Antioch, Alexandria, maybe even Rome. And the empire becomes a vehicle for the expansion of the church to the end of the earth. The Roman roads, and more particularly the roads of the sea across the Mediterranean, which were safe places to be under uh, Roman control. So what we see is the end of evangelism among Jews per se. We see some rebellion within the church community against the Torah in the Old Testament. In the second century, there was a church leader, uh, subsequently determined to be a heretic, whose name was Martian, that's M-A-R-C-I-O-N, not like Martian, but, but Martian, uh, Martian made up his own Bible. And he said, you'd have 10 books out of the New Testament, Gospel of Luke and some of Paul's letters, but nothing from the Old Testament because he believed that the Old Testament was a representative of evil. So he wanted the church to be completely divorced from it. Church didn't take that, thank goodness and kept a, a canon which was balanced. But the fact of the matter is, in these early seeds of activity like that, we see the beginnings of the curse of anti-Semitism, which has become an ethical challenge for the Christian community from that day to this very morning's paper. So, thank you all. I'm sorry we're so long. Thank you.